All right, once again, Monty Shaw here with IRFA. Um, unfortunately, due to the government shutdown, uh, not opening up a day sooner, um, USDA chief economist is not gonna be with us today. That was one of the people we hope to have here. They're restricted from traveling there. So what we decided to do because of the impact of so many lawsuits, because we actually have a, the gentleman next to me here, Adam Gustafson, he's a partner with Boyd and Gray and Associates, where he practices appellate and uh, regulatory law in Washington, D.C. We decided to pull him off of our policy panel and take this next, uh, you know, 25, 30 minutes and talk and, di and dig into some of these lawsuits. So um, Adam's background is that he represents corn growers before the EPA and other federal agency on regulatory matters concerning fuels and vehicles. He's also argued on behalf of ethanol producers in litigation over EPA's fuel regulations and air policy modeling. He comes to us as a graduate of Yale Law School and he clerked uh, for federal judges in the U.S. Courts of Appeals for both the Ninth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit, which is generally considered the highest circuit, I guess. They're the first among equals or some such they, thing. They like to call themselves the second highest court in the land. The second highest court in the land. So I'm going to run through uh, some court case things and some other <laughs> regulatory issues that Adam's working on. And um, hopefully this will give you a chance to really see the impact and know what to watch as these things move forward. So we're gonna dive right in with small refiner exemptions. I mentioned this morning, I think there's at least four um, lawsuits, but first of all, Adam, you know, what is the criteria the EPA is supposed to use when they're actually looking at whether or not to grant a small refinery exemption? Thanks, Monty, I will answer that question. Uh, first, I, I'll just say, uh, I'm sorry that uh, you couldn't have a USDA official here with you today. As a lawyer, I'm used to being the second best solution. Um, and that might be a theme of our conversation today. Uh, sometimes lawsuits are the, the next best solution to a policy disagreement you'd rather have solved uh, in a legislative body or a regulatory body. Um, the, Bonnie, the last time that I was in this room was three years ago, a day that you alluded to before lunch. Um, and I, I went back and looked at what then candidate Donald Trump said when he was on the stage, and it's the, the quote that you alluded to. He said, as president, I would encourage regulators to end restrictions that keep higher blends of ethanol and biofuels from being sold. He committed to uphold the RFS, but he also made this commitment to remove regulatory barriers. And I think that's important, and I'm, I'm pleased to be able to be here today to talk about both of those things, RFS and removing regulatory barriers to a, a market for higher ethanol blends. And we, we will try to get to that in the time we have because it didn't say just E15, it said higher blends. So we'll hope to have some time to dig into that. Um, so to answer your question, you know, what is EPA supposed to consider when it decides whether to grant these small refinery exemptions? Well, the statutory criteria are pretty simple. Um, it has to, or at least on the surface, it looks simple. Um, it applies only to small refiners, that is, those with a throughput of 75, uh, what is it, 75,000 75. barrels or less per day. Um, and then the question is whether there's disproportionate economic hardship. Um, now, the courts have acknowledged that that is an open-ended standard, but they have approved EPA's viability interpretation of that, which basically means if the company is not threatened in, in its ability to compete, then it's not facing disproportionate economic hardship. Um, now, the only other uh, item I should mention is that the statute requires EPA to consult on this question with the Department of Energy. And uh, the DC Circuit has acknowledged that in the past, DOE's recommendation served as the primary factor in EPA's determination. So, so as we dig into that, um, I'll kind of wrap some of these together so you can really unwind it. Um, what, what is the case that our ethanol industry is making in these lawsuits? Um, because we're making these cases because we want to affect the future way these are handled and um, including how the EPA consults with the DOE. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, I can't give you a great answer to that question. The brief that was filed on behalf of ethanol interests is under seal because it contains confidential business information. 
So I don't know the full extent of the arguments that are being made against EPA's small uh, refinery exemptions, but I do know from one of the motions filed in that case that um, they're arguing that EPA's finding of a disproportionate economic impact is contradicted by the agency's own contemporaneous statements um, about how uh, refiners deal with RINs. And, and EPA has stated, stated at the same time it was granting these exemptions, that refineries are able to pass through the costs of RINs to their customer. Now, if that is true, then uh, whatever economic effect the, this refiner may be facing is not the fault of its compliance with the RFS. So I think that's one of the arguments that's going to be made. There could be arguments about whether these refiners qualify as small refineries, whether EPA properly consulted with the Department of Energy as required, and whether it gave an adequate explanation for its changed approach to how it uh, considers whether to grant these waivers. You know, a, th a thought came to me while we're sitting here. Um, we've actually had one of the lawsuits is around FOIA, that's the Freedom of Information Act, because under former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, he basically said, everything about these is confidential business information, so I'm not going to tell you who's applied. I'm not even going to tell you who's got them, uh, which gave them great insider business information to go out and, and manipulate the rent market. That was brilliant. But, um, I, I, irony alert there. But um, then it actually made it hard to sue them. Because to sue, you have to bring facts to the court. And we, the only way we actually got some of these going was because a couple of these refiners who got the waivers reported it in their public filings. Um, but if the EPA is allowed to say everything's confidential business information to ignore four-year requests, then we can't even hold them accountable through the courts because we don't have the facts. And one of the courts said, you know, you got to give us some facts. So can you dig into the FOIA aspects of this a little bit? Um, I, I know that uh, the ethanol interests uh, made eight separate FOIA requests of, um, of EPA, and I know that at least as of last month, EPA had not even begun its search, which is uh, very disappointing, but unfortunately not very surprising. I've, I've litigated FOIA cases against EPA, and I'm afraid that is par for the course. Uh, the, we shouldn't the, feel special? <laughs> the, no, unfortunately. The, the Freedom of Information Act can be a very useful tool for getting documents from the government. There are some limitations to it, and you know, I, I anticipate that EPA will raise some deliberative process privilege claims to protect communications between, uh, the, the, between the agencies. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Okay. What do you think the future impact, if, if you can, um, will be uh, of these lawsuits on the, the, on the future of uh, SREs? Well, I think a win uh, for the ethanol industry would be uh, really important. I think it would make EPA much more cautious about granting these in the future. I don't think it would eliminate the possibility of small refinery exemptions in the future, uh, depending on the rationale that the court uses, assuming ethanol wins. Um, it, it could just make EPA dot its I's and cross its T's more carefully in its consultation with the Department of Energy, but uh, it could be very important. We'll, we'll see what the, what the issues are and what the court decides. Okay. That's what I've said about 2019. It's going to be very impactful, for better or for worse. One of the other lawsuits I brought up earlier today was what I call the remand case. Uh, it's a case that's actually over and that we won. Uh, when in 2016, uh, the EPA decided to rewrite the English language uh, and, and change the definitions of supply and demand around, and to use that as an excuse to waive about half a billion gallons of uh, ethanol from the 2016 RFS uh, level. Uh, we took them to court and said, no, supply means supply and demand means demand. And, and luckily in that case, the plain English came through the court system intact and they were ordered to basically give back that half a billion gallons. Um, they, they've had two different annual uh, RVOs, we call them, RFS level rulemakings in which they could have done that since this court made that court order and they haven't. So, you know, where do we, where do we see this going? It's something I'm, I'm very interested in. I'm interested in it too, Monty, and, and I'm particularly interested in that case uh, because the judge who authored that opinion, then Judge Kavanaugh, is now Justice Kavanaugh on the U.S. Supreme Court. And as you say, 
um, he took the statute at its plain meaning and applied the meaning of inadequate domestic supply and said to EPA, look, you can't claim there's an inadequate domestic supply by pointing to a demand side problem that you've caused by your own failure to implement the, the RFS. He didn't say that last part, but I, I added that part. Um, so I, I think um, why EPA hasn't done, acted on this remand yet, I think is an important question. Uh, I think, you know, as Paul talked about uh, in, in the last session, we've got uh, a reset rule that EPA has said is in the pipeline. It's, EPA has said it's going to come out this year. That, I, I don't know how this government shutdown will affect things. Um, I hope that EPA will prioritize the RVP rule that I hope we'll get to talk about. But um, it's possible that EPA could try to use the reset rule to sort of uh, hide away those extra 500 million gallons. I, I hope that there's no um, trickery involved there, but th that could be a, a shell game to, to watch out for. You know, if, if it was still EPA Administrator Pruitt, I would be very, very concerned about that. Um, I want to give Wheeler the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and I will just tell you, speaking on behalf of Monty Shaw, I don't know how many of my board members are here, so they can either give me a thumbs up or, or afterwards they can tell me to shut up. But um, if the EPA uses the reset, takes our 15 billion gallons um, that, that the, the statutes there that that's has um, never um, not been complied with as it was enforced, um, and then say, oh, we're going to lower that for some, you know, uh, cockamamie reason, oh, but, but then we're giving you your 500 million, you know, so let's say they lower it 250 here, 250 here, and then say, oh, but we're adding your, your 500 back over these two years, and we magically end up at 15 billion gallons. To me, that's a declaration of war. That would be, uh, uh, that would be breaking President Trump's promise that he made on this stage three years ago, and, and I think that we would do all in our power to point that out and, and to make that case very loud and clear. So I hope, I hope people at the EPA and people at the White House know that they, do, they should not play games, or at least they should not expect um, for us to sit idly by and quietly by uh, if they do try to play those games. Um, that would be very, very um, upsetting. Um, I do want to switch, and we might have some time to get back into some of the lawsuits um, on the RVOs and things, but I did want to say um, you're doing some very interesting work. I know work with the Iowa corn growers and other groups um, on um, future fuels and different things, higher blends. So the Sierra Club has been pushing the um, EPA to do what's called an anti-backsliding study. That's where they're supposed to go in and say, hey, because of the implementation of the RFS, have there been any unintended air quality um, uh, backsliding, you know, harm done? And if so, then they have to take care of it. Well, one of the challenges with that is there's this moves model where they plug in data on ethanol into a broken model and get a broken answer. And I know you guys have been working on that. So can you talk a little bit about what Sierra Club's doing and, and what we might need to make happen so that we don't get, you know, when you add more ethanol, we know in the real world the emissions go down. But in the EPA's model, the emissions go up. So that is a big, big challenge for us out there. It's a, it's a very big challenge. Um, so, so we were very troubled to see Sierra Club bring a lawsuit against EPA, um, urging the court to require EPA to perform this anti-backsliding study that's now long overdue. That it was you know, supposed to be done years and years ago. Um, EPA hasn't done it, uh, and now Sierra Club's urging EPA to do it. They know that when EPA does this analysis of the environmental effects of the RFS, they will look to EPA's vehicle and fuel effects model, MOVES 2014, to calculate the air quality effects of blending ethanol into gasoline. And th this is a topic that some in this room have, have studied uh, quite a bit. We know a lot about what is wrong with the MOVES model. We know that the MOVES model is contradicted by lots of peer-reviewed science that demonstrates, as you say, when you add ethanol to gasoline, you lower emissions. We see that not just as a matter of uh, empirical studies, but as a matter of history. It has, our air quality in the United States has improved as aromatics have gone down, aromatic hydrocarbons and gasoline have gone down to make room for higher levels of ethanol. Um, unfortunately, the MOVES model 
says the opposite. What can, we do to, what can we do to fix it? Can EPA fix it? What would they need to do? So uh, what EPA would have to do is to redo the study on which that model was based. Um, so back in 2009 through 2011, EPA, in collaboration with uh, oil interests, the Coordinating Research Council and other uh, oil interests, uh, conducted a study, a big study of 27 vehicles uh, 27 fuels, 15 or 19 vehicles, um, and tried to predict the emissions effects of different fuel components, including ethanol concentration. The problem is that the high ethanol content fuels were loaded with lots of bad stuff that EPA put there in order to set, uh, to, to hold constant certain fuel parameters. But the effect of that bad stuff that they added to the high ethanol content fuels was predictably that the high ethanol content fuels performed worse. They had and, and not because of more ethanol, but because of this other stuff. That exactly. Was added. So I think what needs to happen here is that EPA needs to conduct a new study. Fortunately, the law requires EPA to examine and revise, if necessary, its emissions factors every three years. It's now been more than three years since the, the past moves model, okay. and and so I think. Uh, we should urge a new study, but we should urge that it be done with adult supervision, so to speak. Uh, the Department of Energy um, is well qualified to do this work. Uh, they do this as, uh, this is their job. Um, Oak Ridge Labs and other national labs, and uh, there are relevant offices within the DOE that have funding already appropriated for this kind of study. So I think this is a, an important opportunity um, to get this work done, to improve EPA's modeling, so that when EPA does an anti-backsliding study or any analysis of, of the environmental effects of ethanol blending, ethanol gets credit for the remarkable job it's done in improving our air quality and public health. Yeah, it's very frustrating to me when they test fuels that aren't real-world fuels to create a model that then won't have real-world um, predictions or, or outcomes. So getting that fixed uh, is going to be very important during this process because otherwise, you know, they could come back and use, oh, look, negative environmental outcomes in our model, even though the real world is exactly the opposite. We need to, during reset or post-2023, change volumes, do different things uh, that can be very detrimental to us. EPA's explanation for, for this methodology is, oh, we want to isolate the emissions effects of individual parameters. <laughs> And to do that, we have to have this highly specialized match blending. The problem with that methodology, it, it works in theory, but the problem is in the real world, there's a whole host of hidden variables that are changed whenever you add a component yeah. to fuel. So it, if you're interested in that topic, talk to Steve Vandergreen because he's um, been working hard on um, uh, 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 meta-analysis of these uh, studies that shows, demonstrates the problems with EPA's methodology. Um, Paul, in our last, our last speaker, mentioned the SAFE rule. Uh, many of you might remember that uh, one of the big rules under uh, former President Obama was a CAFE standard, CAFE slash greenhouse gas standard. It was going to raise everybody to like 54 miles per gallon or something. And uh, one of the things that President Trump has done is come in and said, um, hey, we need to relook re at that. Uh, it was rushed on a rush timeline and, and, and the science wasn't there. So now the EPA and the Department of Transportation have jointly proposed a new um, uh, relaxed, lower uh, than what, what was out there, fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards. Um, how, what kind of role does ethanol play or could play in that type of system? Well, in a word, the key parameter is octane. As, as we've heard earlier today, you know, ethanol has a tremendous value to add to fuel in the form of octane. It's the thing that the auto industry desperately needs in order to improve efficiency and meet these standards. <coughs> Even if EPA and DOT finalize the rule as proposed, flatlining fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards for the next several years, that will still be a huge challenge to the auto industry to meet. They're digging into past credits because Compliance is going to be a huge challenge. Um, ethanol alleviates that difficulty because it, it allows the automakers to design for uh, more efficient vehicles with high compression ratios. 
And so we were very pleased to see EPA respond to our input and in the proposed rule to ask for comment yeah. on the potential benefits high octane fuels could provide via the blending of non-petroleum feedstocks. That, that was very encouraging to hear EPA invite comment on that. And we were even more encouraged by the response from our friends in the auto industry as well as uh, groups represented here. So uh, the Auto Alliance in its comments on this proposed fuel economy greenhouse gas rule uh, advocated, this is a quote, for the availability of cost effective higher octane fuel by quote, expanding ethanol availability. And uh, Ford Motor Company, quote, supports an increase in the use of renewable fuels, including low carbon fuels. So that was great to hear from the auto industry and they were well supported by a, a broad range of stakeholders who were unified in their support uh, for the efficiency, greenhouse gas, and air quality benefits of a mid-level blend um, that advocated for EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act to set a minimum octane standard. This is something EPA officials have, have already recognized they could do. Um, and the, the ethanol industry was also united in identifying regulatory barriers that have to be removed in order for these benefits to be realized. Okay. Um, we're going to try to get through a couple more questions. We might have time for one from the audience, but let me try to get through a couple more and, and still land this plane on time. Um, we've talked throughout the day about the year-round E15, the RVP rulemaking. Uh, we think it still has a chance to be done by June 1st, but when that proposed rule comes out for public comment, we know it's going to be ultimately challenged in court. So what should we be, from a legal standpoint, what, what are you going to be looking for? What should we be looking for to see, hey, are they doing it in a way that's going to stand up? That's exactly the question. Is this rule going to hold up in court? And the, the second question that I'll be asking when I look at the proposed rule is, is this a solution for E15 only, or is it a solution that opens the door to mid-level blends? The, the situation that I think we should try hard to avoid is um, a rule that barely allows E15 to be sold year-round, but then leaves in place barriers that could easy, easily be uh, removed and should be removed to higher ethanol blends. So we, we shouldn't be having the same fight when we're talking about an E25 or whatever the future fuel may be. Um, so there are basically three solutions that EPA could work out. There, remember that in 2011, EPA granted a sub-SIM waiver for E15. That's why E15 is, is on the market today. That was necessary because at the time, there was no ethanol in the certification fuel that automakers use when they're uh, demonstrating their new vehicle's compliance with emissions and greenhouse gas standards. Um, at the time, we needed a sub-SIM waiver because there was no ethanol. And that sub-SIM waiver that EPA granted imposed a limit on the reed vapor pressure, the evaporative tendency of the E15 fuel. It put a nine pound per square inch limit. And that's now the problem that's being dealt with. The question is, how do we deal with that 2011 E15 waiver and the RVP limit there? And there are three possible solutions. One is not a sufficient solution in my view. It's just to fix the 2011 waiver, redo the waiver and remove the RVP solution. Okay. That, that leaves you at E15. But I think a, a better solution uh, the second tier solution would be just to say, well, E15 is now similar to E10 cert fuel, so you don't need the waiver anymore, that 2011. Because now the certification fuel is E10, whereas before it was a non-ethanol. Exactly. Thing. But the third approach, and the one that I think is, criti is critical to the success of higher blends, is to say that because ethanol is now in the cert fuel, ethanol is no longer controlled by the subsim law. The subsim law only prohibits increasing concentration of fuel additives that are not substantially similar to fuel additives utilized in certification. But now we've got ethanol in the cert fuel, that changes everything. If EPA were to recognize that, it would mean that we don't any longer need 
waivers like the 2011 waiver for higher blends, it would make the introduction of mid-level ethanol blends much easier. I'm not going to give you my prediction on which one they won't have in the, in the proposed rule, but I hope you're right. Um, I wouldn't mind if they threw every conceivable justification in the rule um, because it only takes one to uphold it in court. That, and I think a belt and suspenders approach like that is the pragmatic and smart way to do it. Um, and I think if EPA wants to have this rule succeed, what they'll do is adopt multiple rationales yeah. to provide multiple legal defenses in court. Yeah. Um, there's probably about 10 other questions I should be asking you, but our time's running short. Uh, clearly, we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, I like to make lawyer jokes, you know, so you guys are going to have a good year. Uh, depending on the outcome of these court cases, it may or, not, may or may not be a good year for us in the courts. But um, is there anything that, as you, as you see all of these different lawsuits and all these different facets, is there anything out there that gives you hope um, uh, for a pro-renewable, excuse me, pro-biofuels future, if you will, coming out of this situation? Well, one thing that gives me hope is that after President, then candidate Trump, made his commitment to biofuels on this stage, he then didn't just stay there, but he, he issued executive orders that stated a national policy of promoting agriculture and rural prosperity, promoting the communities where renewable fuels are produced. That's a quote from, the, from one of the executive orders of uh, promoting energy independence. And if the administration is serious about those things, that I think is a cause for hope. Um, and I, I see a cause for hope in the White House's instructions to EPA on the RVP rule. That's only a first step, but it was a critical first step in removing barriers to, to mid-level blends. So I think there's uh, a lot of cause for hope there. I think the, pol the internal politics are also a cause for hope. We're seeing real convergence between the interests of the biofuel community and the interests of the auto industry, which is desperate for octane and sees that we've got the only product that will serve their needs at a cost consumers uh, can afford. And I think that's cause for hope. It was especially interesting this year, this past year, to see that not only biofuel and autos, but also the oil industry began to see, oh, for liquid fuels to have a future, we might need to do something different. We, we need to be more efficient. And, and I, that gives me hope. I think if we're willing to be uh, pragmatic, to uh, make, um, build coalitions around shared uh, interests, uh, we've got a lot to gain. Okay. I don't see one of the microphones, and we're over time. So I want to thank Adam, and I will say, you know, you, you point out what the president did. Um, there's certainly a lot of things I can criticize, you know, the appointment of Pruitt, the small refiner exemptions. But we should also be fair and say we asked several presidents to take the step of, of directing the EPA to start a rulemaking process to approve year-round E15. Um, yes, the EPA needs to put out a good one. Yes, we need to defend it and, and hopefully win in court. But none of that happens if we don't start the process. And so that is, that is a good place to start. As you guys can see, there are a lot of things going on out there this year. So, uh, you know, keep your seat belts on. And with that, please join me in giving a round of applause to Adam for joining us today.